Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vincent Racaniella. Welcome to Virology. I guess it's pretty popular, huh? This is the fourth year of this course. First year, we had 30 students. And we have a lot registered. The room is crowded. But I guarantee you that next Monday and the Wednesday, there'll be plenty of seats. Okay? It's, it happens every year. A lot of people drop, or people don't come. So you will have seats uh, in the future. There are lots of seats in the interior here as well, but um, there'll be plenty of places for you to sit. So don't worry. If you want to learn about viruses, uh, stay with us. So let me just tell you a few administrative details before we start talking about viruses. As I said, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm going to be uh, teaching this course. I have helping me uh, a number of able-bodied individuals. First, Saul Silverstein. Uh, he's in the back. He's my colleague. Saul and I are both professors at the medical center uptown. We've been working on viruses between the two of us for almost 70 years, and we want to tell you what we know. And we don't have to teach this course. When you're teaching at a medical center, as you may find out one day, teaching is not something that you have to do. You have to do research and raise grant money and run your lab. But we decided uh, four years ago that we wanted to impart our knowledge about viruses to more people. So that's why we're doing this. So we love virology, and we want to get you to love it as well. And I guess you think you like it already because you're here taking this course. There are a lot of ways you can contact me. Here's my email. I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm on Google+. Plus. I do this because I, not, I, only, I don't want to just teach you virology. I want to teach the world virology. I'll tell you more about that uh, in a moment. Here's Saul Silverstein's uh, email. We have three terrific TAs this year. Uh, here standing in the front is Ashley Bennett, who's done it uh, last year. We're the TA last year. Ashley's a PhD student uh, in my laboratory doing work on viruses. Uh, we also have Stephanie Sarbanes, who's waved to everyone, Stephanie. Uh, she took the course last semester and liked it so much she wanted to TA it, right? Uh, so, and then our third TA is Katharina Shaw, who's not here today. Uh, Katharina also took the course. Actually, you took it two years ago, right? So you, it's time for you to catch up, right? And Katharina took it last semester. Uh, they will have review sessions for you. They will be available to help you. You can ask any of us questions at any time. Uh, the textbook I suggest you buy, you don't have to do this. You can probably do very well without it. Uh, but I, if you do want a textbook to enhance your understanding, uh, it's this one. It's a two-volume set, Principles of Virology. Uh, and basically, this course is formed around this textbook. It's divided into two parts. Volume one is molecular biology. Volume two is pathogenesis. And we format the course in the same way. We have the first 10 lectures about replication. The next 10 are about pathogenesis. Uh, I think if you really are into virology, you should get it. Uh, it's going to be a resource for a long time. If you find it difficult to understand the material just from the lectures, by all means, try it and see if it helps you. Again, you don't have to get it. But I think if you're into virology and if you want to try understanding the material in a different way, it will help you a lot. And this has been ordered at the bookstore. Now, I also will, at, from time to time, give you assignments of reading from my blog and from my podcast. I write uh, weekly on different aspects of virology as it appears to the public. So when things happen in the news, I write about them to try and explain them. We have quite a bit of traffic here, and I think you'll find them interesting. You don't have to read it every day, but now and then peruse through it and see what's on my mind. Again, if you want to really delve into virology, and I know you have other things to do as well, but if you're really into virology, you want to wrap your head completely around it, you should have a look at this. I also do a weekly podcast with my virology colleagues. We get on Skype and record, we record a conversation about what's going on in virology. And I will assign a few of these throughout the semester so that you can get a flavor of what's going on in the world. Think, you can hear about how virologists think. These are the conversations that happen uh, in the hallways, but no one ever hears. Uh, now you can get to hear them. And this, these are both quite popular. Many, many thousands of people are, are checking them out. This is an example of a blog post 
for example, WHO a few weeks ago said it's going to switch to the inactivated polio vaccine. For most of you, that doesn't mean anything, so I try and explain it, and, and the public reads this. Uh, it's an example of one of our podcasts, uh, which we did a few weeks ago. We basically take a few stories that are ongoing in the virology field, and me and a couple of my co-hosts talk about them. And again, this, these podcasts have been going on for four years now. This one has been downloaded two million times. So we have lots and lots of people who out there who are interested in virology. It's all part of my goal not to just teach a course uh, to students, but to reach as many people as possible, because I think it's incredibly important to understand uh, how viruses work and how they impact you. You can ask questions anytime. I know this is a big room. Uh, and those of you who came in late, by the way, uh, I told everyone earlier there'll probably be plenty of seats after this lecture next time, so you should be able to sit down. Um, ask questions anytime. I'm happy to take them during class. Um, I'm going to try and repeat them so that they get recorded. A lot of people out there in the world always complain that I don't repeat the questions and they can't hear it, but I invariably forget. So please, someone shout out, repeat the question. Okay, can you remember to do that? I'm happy to answer them. We love questions, and um, it's the way to learn here. OK. We live and prosper in a world full of viruses. Earth is full of them. We, viruses infect everything. All living things on Earth have some sort of virus. And most of the time, we haven't actually discovered it yet. But uh, everything that we know of probably has a virus that infects it. We, ingest, we ingest, we breathe in, we take up viruses by the billions on a regular basis. This room is teeming with viruses, especially at this time of year when there are lots of respiratory infections going around. If you happen to have one, and at least one of you has some sort of upper respiratory infection, you are exhaling viruses. This room is full of them. If we sampled the air, we would be able to isolate them. We carry viral genomes as part of our genetic material. We cannot escape uh, viruses. And as you will see in this course, not only do they make you sick, but they probably are responsible for your health as well. The numbers, when we talk about viruses, this is one of the main things I want you to appreciate through this course. The numbers of viruses on the planet are staggering. And this is one of the reasons why they are so successful. For example, bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. There are more than 10 to the 30th of these viruses in the oceans of the world. That's something like a couple of million uh, virus particles per teaspoon. So every time you go into the ocean and you take some water in your mouth and you spit it out playfully, you are aerosolizing many, many millions of viruses. It's not harming you at all. We, are, we do that all the time, and we're very healthy. Now, just to give you an example of what happens when you have numbers like this, if you calculate the total mass of just these bacteriophages in the world's water, it exceeds the biomass of elephants by more than a thousandfold. So these are things you cannot see, right, with the naked eye. You cannot see them. They are so tiny, yet the biomass is incredible simply because there's so many of them. If you line them up head to tail, these bacteriophages, uh, 10 to the 30th of them, that would go, that line of them would stretch for 200 million light years. That's a long ways. And these, again, are things that you can barely see. And someone actually did these calculations. You can go check out this, this website to see that. 200 million light years is pretty far. The closest galaxy uh, is 2.5 million light years away. So that's remarkable. And those are just the bacteriophages uh, in the oceans. Whales are infected with small RNA viruses, diagrammed here, called calici viruses. And these are viruses that uh, are well known to cause disease in humans. They cause gastroenteritis. In whales, they can also cause disease. They can cause blisters and rashes, uh, gastroenteritis, and so forth. And sometimes the whale viruses actually infect people. This happens very often in the world of viruses. These are called zoonotic infections. Animal viruses infect people. In fact, 
most of the viruses, I would say all the viruses we have right now came from animals at one time or another. These whales excrete 10 to the 13th virus particles every day in their feces. It's a huge number of virus particles. And every other living thing in the ocean also has its own viruses. All the other mammals and the fishes as well have viruses of their own. If you look at the biomass uh, in the world's oceans, this is simply a pie chart showing uh, the fraction that's prokaryotic, uh, protists, and viruses. We don't even show the eukaryotes here because they would be such a small sliver. So the prokaryotes by mass alone predominate in the ocean's waters. But by abundance, by sheer numbers, you can see the viruses predominate. There are just so many of them. And these viruses play really important roles in the biology, not only of the ocean, but of the whole planet. They, it, there are so many infections per second in the surface waters of the ocean that turns over an amazing amounts of carbon and contributes to geothermal cycles that are important for regulating the entire globe. So they really have an amazing uh, effect on the planet. At the moment, there are 10 to the 16th human immunodeficiency virus genomes on the planet. It's a calculation based on the number of infected individuals and how many genomes we know to be in each person. That number is so big that it means that it is likely that there are already mutant viruses resistant to every antiviral we have at the moment. And we currently have something like between 20 and 30 anti-HIV antivirals. So we're already out there, there's, there's resistance. It just hasn't shown up yet. In addition, that number is so big that whatever drug we ever make for the foreseeable future, the resistant mutants are already out there. That's how big that number is, uh, that, that we cannot combat the resistance uh, in simple manners. So how infected, in fact, are we? Well, each of you is infected, besides these respiratory viruses that may be bothering you, you are infected with at least two of these herpes viruses. We'll talk a bit about herpes viruses in this course. There are quite a few of them. Herpes simplex virus types 1 and 2, uh, varicella zoster virus, human cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, and then the human herpes viruses 6, 7, and 8. So each of you has at least two of these. These are what they look like. And once you're infected with the herpes viruses, you are stuck with them for the rest of your life. They remain with you. Uh, and sometimes reactivate to cause infections. And this picture of eggs is here to remind me that on the average, we all have about a dozen different viruses in us at any given time, in addition to these two uh, herpes viruses. Some have probably more, some have probably less. Uh, these viruses, for the most part, don't bother us. They may initially cause disease when they infect us, but I think for the most part, they coexist peacefully with us. And this is an area that we know really little about. Uh, are these viruses of benefit to us? We, just, we simply don't know. Now, you all may be aware of efforts to determine the human microbiome. That is, all the bacteria that inhabit on us and in us. There are many different microbes that we carry. And they are beneficial microbes, of course. They do great things for us. And the NIH has uh, been running a study for a number of years now to sequence and identify the microbiome at all these different body sites. So these are sites in all, all parts of the skin, the gastrointestinal tract as well, uh, and other areas where we know bacteria live. And we'd like to know what they are, because this simply hasn't been done. And so that's the microbiome. There's also a virome, a human virome. That is, all the viruses that live on and in us. For sure, these bacteria, these beneficial bacteria, are infected with phages that probably help them to carry out their functions that help us. But in addition, there are eukaryotic viruses, viruses that infect our cells that probably are beneficial also. And there's no current plan to determine the human virome. It hasn't reached the prominence of the microbiome. But uh, we do have viruses at all these sites and in our guts and in our lungs that have taken up residence there. And I think it's important to enumerate them and figure out what they're doing. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that we carry viruses as part of our genetic material. Uh, this is a pie chart which shows fractions of our genome uh, that, is, that are dedicated to different purposes. So, for example, introns, 25% of our genome consists of intervening sequences that are removed by splicing. Um, and you can see a variety of other things here. What I want, the protein coding genes are, in fact, the minimum of our genome, amazingly. 8% of our genome by sequence consists of what are called LTR retrotransposons. These are basically viral remnants that are integrated into our genome. We'll talk a lot about that later on. They're derived from viruses called retroviruses. We carry them. Many animals do carry such uh, endogenous retroviral genomes. We don't make any infectious particles from these, but many other animals do. And they seem to have been with us for many, many years, perhaps from even before we became homo sapiens. And we don't know if they are of benefit or not. They, some people think they must be because they've been maintained for so long. And there are some examples in animals where genes are expressed from these endogenous viral sequences and they are of benefit. Yes? The question is, how do you figure out that these sequences are viral as opposed to something else? So we have sequenced many viral genomes over the years. And so when the human genome was sequenced and compared to all the known sequences, it became very evident that these were viral sequences. And you can, even, you can identify sequences being viral even if they are 100 or 200 million years old because there's enough conservation. Now, of course, there are probably sequences that we don't recognize that are viral. And there's not much we can do about that until we get some evidence that they are, in fact, from viruses. Anyway, you pass these on to your children, and your children pass them on to them. They are hereditary. They are her inherited. And so what they're doing is anyone's guess for now. We'll, as I said, we'll be talking more about that later. So I've been telling you about all these viruses that impinge on you constantly, but amazingly, for the most part, none of them really harm us, or very rarely do they harm us. We'll, we'll get a respiratory infection, we'll get gastroenteritis, but considering all the viruses that infect us or impinge on us on a daily basis, we're pretty healthy. And that's because we have this amazing immune system, which is diagrammed at the left here. And if some of you have taken uh, Professor Moshewitz's immunology course, I'm sure, but how many of you have? Yeah, so you heard me talk about vaccines then. Um, you know all about this. And we'll talk a little bit of <coughs> immunology in this course as it relates to virus infections. But for those of you who have a great immune system, you're pretty healthy with respect to virus infections. But when your immune system is down, if you have AIDS, for example, that's an immunosuppressive infection. Measles is an immunosuppressive <coughs> infection. Or if you have an organ transplant, and you are immunosuppressed because you're being given uh, drugs that prevent rejection of the transplant, then even the most innocuous virus infection can kill you. So this immune system is incredibly important, and we'll be talking a bit about that, about that in this course as well. Not all viruses make you sick. In fact, virology is tainted in a way because the field arose to study viruses that made humans sick. And it gets money and support for research to solve health problems. The National Institutes of Health, right, NIH, is aimed at keeping you healthy. But I think, and many others do, that there are plenty of viruses in us that don't make us sick, and perhaps they even help us. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. So on the upper left here in this slide is a uh, polyomavirus. These are rather small viruses that have... Uh, DNA genomes, uh, and there are a variety of polyomaviruses that infect all sorts of animals. We have about a dozen different uh, sorts of polyomaviruses that infect us. I would say if we took blood from all of you and looked for antibodies to these polyomaviruses, 95% of you would have antibodies. That means you were infected at one time with one of these polyomaviruses. And we're not sure uh, if they cause any disease at all. In fact, antibodies to these have been used to trace the migrations of peoples from their origins in Africa 
to Europe and Asia and the Americas. So you can distinguish the different polyomaviruses by serum antibodies, and then you can track those, the movement of those uh, in, in migration. It's really quite an interesting story. And on this slide, what I am showing you is the predicted migration of Homo sapiens from Africa uh, to Europe, Asia, and the Americas. The black line is what is known from our genome. If we can compare the genomes of all the individuals on these different continents, this is the map of migration that was derived from that. The dotted line is a migratory map based on antibodies to these polyomaviruses, which they, again are in many, many people without apparent consequence. And you can see that this traces a slightly different path uh, from Africa to Europe uh, to the northern parts of this continent. And this dotted line, this path which is traceable by uh, antibodies, by serology, it cannot be detected in our genomes. So it's telling us something different. Here's a wonderful, one wonderful example of a good virus in nature. There are, there are dozens of these. We could spend an entire uh, hour talking about them. They're fascinating. And this one is in a plant. Uh, this is called a panic grass. And it lives in environments where the temperature is over 50 degrees Celsius. So you go by uh, Yellowstone Park, by the geysers and the hot springs, you will find these grasses growing right there. They can grow in very high temperatures. A number of years ago, it was found that in order for these grasses to grow at high temperatures, they have to be colonized by a fungus called Curvularia protuberata. So if you take the plant into the lab and you, you cure it of the fungus, it will now not be able to grow at 50 degrees. It turns out that the fungus, in, in turn, is infected by a virus. And both the virus and the fungus are required in order for the plant to live at high temperatures. So the virus is part of this symbiosis here. The, the fungus gets to grow on the plant, and the plant grows at high temperatures because of both the fungus and the virus. And again, there are many, many really neat examples of this kinds, uh, these kinds of symbiosis. So basically, this was just a little tantalizing view of virology. If any of you are thinking maybe this course isn't for you, virology is just amazing. Viruses are amazing. And this course is going to teach you why we think they are and how they are amazing. So that's our goal. And if you stick with us by the end, you're going to know more than 99.99% of the world's population about viruses. Because in fact, most individuals know very little. And one of my goals is to impart that knowledge to you because you're going to go out into the world and you're going to look at headlines and newscasts about viruses. And I want you to be able to distinguish the ones that are completely wrong from the ones that are right. And I can tell you by having looked at the news media over the years that most of the virus stories are reported uh, incorrectly. Uh, for example, here is a, um, a, a shot from a CNN news program, 2009, when we had a pandemic influenza virus emerge. And this, this person was saying, uh, this virus can ravage the lungs, spread through the respiratory system, causing lesions. It doesn't stay in the head like seasonal flu. That isn't even right, because <laughs> seasonal flu moves into your lungs, for sure. That is influenza. It's not an upper tract infection. But these two statements were based on a study done in ferrets. Okay, And it turned out that they were the complete opposite of what the virus did in people. But what are they doing here on CNN? They're trying to scare everyone and get people to watch and go, wow, that's amazing what they're doing. And this is completely wrong. So, I, and so if you didn't know anything about virology, you'd watch this and, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen here? I want you to go and, and be able to distinguish between all of these uh, incorrect news reports. Now, this is not to say that all of them are wrong, but many of them are wrong. And I, I hope maybe some of you will be journalists someday and you'll know to write the right story. So if not, you can email me and ask me if that's correct or not. Uh, here's another example. This is a story which we will dedicate a lecture to at the end of the course. Avian influenza virus, H5N1. Uh, at the beginning of uh, 2012, the end of 2011 actually, a couple of investigators uh, 
modified these viruses so they could be transmitted by the in the air among ferrets. Now these uh, avian viruses kill birds, but they're not very good at transmitting from person to person. In fact, there's no evidence that they can do so. And these investigators made a strain that could transmit in the air among ferrets. The New York Times said they were making a, an engineered doomsday because they were afraid that the sequences of these viruses would get into the hands of bioterrorists and they would be used to make a weapon of mass destruction. The New York Times didn't even have the paper that described the results and they said uh, the work should never have been done. Looks like the research should never have been done. It turned out that these viruses were not lethal in ferrets at all. They gained the ability to become aerosol transmitted, but they lost fitness as a consequence and they were no longer virulent. The New York Times didn't know that. And even if they did, I'm not sure they would have understood it. So again, I want you to be able to read something like this and understand uh, what's right or wrong about it. So here's my overview of what I want you to learn. I want you to learn the big picture of virology. If you notice the syllabus, this is not a course where each lecture is on a different virus. That is not the way to learn virology. That's a good way to investigate specific viruses later on. But for a first virology course, what you need is an integrated overview of the whole field. And the only way you can do that is to get away from the one lecture, one virus approach. Many people do that. I have lots of colleagues who I highly respect, and they say to me, Vinny, I can't teach the way your book is written. I got to teach virus by virus. And I say, oh, you're wrong. I do it every year and it works. <laughs> so you're not going to learn, for example, basic principles of pathogenesis by me teaching you how flu does it, how herpes does it, how Ebola virus does it. So that's why we have lectures on attachment and entry, replication, packaging, and so forth. So that's what I mean we want you to think about virology as an integrated discipline, not an isolated collection of viruses, diseases, or genes. We're trying to give you the overview. Now, once you've taken this course, that would be great for you to take another course where each lecture is a virus, because then you could go into it deeply. And I'm thinking of teaching that someday as well. That would be a fun course. But the prerequisite would be this one. And you're going to learn all about how these wizards amaze the informed and frighten the uninformed. So that's it. If you don't know about viruses, you're scared. And there's no need to be most of the time. And I want you to go out into the world and be informed uh, about viruses. OK, so what is a virus anyway? Here's our definition that we have used for years. An infectious obligate intracellular parasite. We used to have small in there. And for reasons that I think will become obvious, that's, that's sort of redundant because the fact is viruses have to get into cells in order to multiply. So they would have to be small. So I've taken that out of the definition. I've taken the license of removing it from the definition. So infectious is clear to you. Uh, obligate, you have to do this. They have to go inside of cells. And they're parasites. A parasite is something that benefits at the expense of another organism. It's typically a different species. It doesn't have to harm it, but it benefits from its uh, interaction with that organism. All right, so that's the most basic definition you can have of viruses. Then to take it a little bit more, viruses package their genome in a particle of some kind, and that particle is needed to transmit the genome from host to host. The genome the nucleic acid, we use genome to call, to call what the nucleic acid is, contains information to initiate and complete an infectious cycle. So an infectious cycle is what goes on when the virus infects the cell. And we have, I believe the next lecture is called the infectious cycle. We're going to explore exactly what that is. But all of that is directed by the genetic information of the particle. And finally, uh, the genome of the virus is able to establish itself in a population so that it can endure. If it can't do this, the virus will be extinguished. And there are many examples of viruses that have been around and are now extinct. They haven't been able to, to establish themselves in a population. One of the things you will learn from this course is that virology or viruses are, are very dynamic. They come and go. And there, is, there isn't a tear shed over that. The viruses have no human features whatsoever. 
They exist only because they make a lot of themselves and natural selection takes over. And if a particular virus is extinguished, another one will be taking its place. So that is our definition of viruses. Now, already today before class, someone asked me about, are viruses alive? So this is a question that is hotly debated. And in fact, um, over a year ago, I put up a poll on my blog, are viruses alive? And the possibilities were yes, no, something in between, and I don't know. And we had almost 4, 3,300 responses. And you can see they were evenly split. And these are people from all over the world, not just uh, students like yourselves, but people who are interested in viruses. Now, for some reason, this survey disappeared two weeks ago. SurveyMonkey decided that unless you pay, you can't have more than 100 responses to your survey, which is too bad because I had such a nice history there. So I made up a new survey on another site. And uh, we have a few hundred responses so far. And these are, I, I made it slightly different. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, you can take this survey. You can take it now or maybe at the end of the course and see what you think. I think viruses are not living. But many people debate this. And when I say viruses are not living, I actually mean the virus particle. What are the attributes of life? You can reproduce, you can evolve, you can undergo metabolism. In my view, a virus particle can't do any of those. Okay, virus particles are inert chemicals. They're very nice chemicals, very complicated, but they do nothing. If I had a tube of viruses here, it would sit here without doing a thing forever. It would not evolve, it would not metabolize, it would not reproduce, unless I add a cell that the virus could get into and then do all of those things. So that, that's what I mean. I think many people, when we say our virus is alive, they have this idea of an infected cell. They say, well, of course a, a virus is alive because the infected cell is alive. And so, in fact, um, here is a better way to look at the question, are viruses alive? And this is actually an idea set forth by a evolutionary virologist whose work we'll come back to later. And what he proposes is that a virus is an organism with two phases. There's the virion, all right, that's the inert substance which composed of protein and nucleic acid, sometimes some lipid and carbohydrate. And then there's the infected cell. So distinguishing between the virus and the virion is very important for this definition. The virion is this infectious particle. The virus is this organism which has two phases, a virion and an infected cell. So I would totally agree that the infected cell is living. Of course it is, because the cell is living. It may be dead eventually, but the virus will get out of it, and then you will have the virion. The virion is clearly uh, not infectious. Now, you can, you can approximate this to a spore or a seed, which can sit on a surface forever and never have any of the properties of life. But of course, once you add nutrients, that they, then they become living. So in a way, the virion is like that. The virion is non-living, but once it gets into an infected cell, it becomes living. So this is my view. There's no answer to this, and you may have your own, and, and that's fine. But I think it's interesting to think about because it makes you refine um, what's living and what's not living. Now, because viruses are parasites, they're obligate intracellular parasites. They have to get into a cell in order to multiply. To make more viruses, the virus has to get inside a cell. If it doesn't get inside a cell, nothing will happen. So whenever we study viruses, we learn not just about the virus, but the host as well. We learn about cells. Uh, for example, we can learn about mosquito hosts, protists, and even humans and plants. We learn about the host. And so many discoveries in biology has, have been revealed by using viruses to probe hosts. Uh, very basic stuff like splicing. Splicing of genes was discovered in virus-infected cells, and so many others. So when you study viruses, you're not just studying the virion, studying the virion, you're studying the infected cell. And you will learn about that as well. Now, uh, many, many textbooks and many of my colleagues, in fact, uh, use anthropomorphic analyses to teach virology. They talk about offense versus defense, and armies of viruses, and battles. 
this is this in my view is completely wrong because it assigns human qualities to viruses. Oh, the virus wants to do this. The virus thinks it's doing this, but it wants to do that. Those, those are the kinds of anthropomorphisms I'm talking about. Now, you may say, well, this is harmless. What, what's the, the, the harm done? But in fact, the way we reason, and we humans obviously reason in a certain way about outcomes and so forth, viruses don't do that. They have no reason. So there's no point in, in saying viruses ensure, employ, exhibit, or display anything. So we, in fact, in our textbook, tried to purge it of all of these anthropomorphisms. And if you find one, let me know, because I think we got rid of them all. So the, the basic view here is that viruses evolve because they make lots of progeny. They're subject to selection. Some win and some lose, and that's it. The viruses that win are not happy. The viruses that lose are not sad. The viruses that win don't want to win. They have, they have no say in the matter whatsoever. Whatever the selective force is placed on them, that is what determines the outcome. So don't think of viruses as you would think of yourself or your brother or your sister or any, any human being. It just doesn't work. Uh, I wrote about this on the blog some time ago, and, and a virologist who I know in France said, yeah, but isn't it good to know, to think about viruses in human ways from time to time? It helps you clarify your thinking. No, it doesn't. It doesn't help you clarify your thinking because you're making human assumptions about what viruses can do. Okay, so this is one of my pet peeves and um, I hope that you, you can avoid these as well. Now, how small are viruses? Obviously, they have to get in a cell, but I want you to have a sense of the size of viruses. So here's a slide that I think does that very nicely. Uh, here's E. coli. It's a big guy right here. And it has a bacteriophage attached to it. Uh, so these are quite large. Here is a virion. It's called tobacco mosaic virus. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, here's human immunodeficiency virus. So these are, this is uh, magnified 100,000 times. Now in this panel are a variety of molecules and even a virus. And um, here it is exploded so you can see. Here's a carbon atom, uh, a tRNA, an antibody molecule, some ribosomes. And this is a virus. Here's, this is poliovirus. So it's quite small. You can see it's about the size of a ribosome. So there it is right there. So you see uh, some viruses are quite large. Others are quite small. Here's some cellular molecules, myosin and actin, to give you an idea. So this is now magnified a million times. Of course, the answer to the age-old question, how many viruses can you fit on the head of a pin? The answer is, well, if you're talking about the common cold virus, about 500 million. So every time you sneeze, you fire an aerosol that has a lot of virus particles. Every droplet that you make when you sneeze has about 20,000 virus particles in it. This is an actual um, head of a pin with various organisms on it to give you some example. This is a dust mite, I believe, right here. And over here in this box are where the viruses will be. Here it is magnified. Uh, these are red blood cells. Uh, I think this is a lymphocyte, this is a yeast cell, a pollen. And here the virus is all clumped up in here. These are various bacteria here. So the viruses are quite small compared to everything else. This is another view that helps you appreciate size. Here's a cell, a eukaryotic cell with a nucleus, of course. And there are two different viruses on its surface. One is herpes virus, shown here. You can see it quite clearly there. But then there's another smaller virus there, poliovirus. And that's the one that's about the size of ribosomes. So you see poliovirus is about 30 nanometers. That's not the smallest virus, but it, it's approaching the smallest virus. Herpes virus is 200 nanometers. The biggest viruses are about 800 nanometers in diameter. Here is uh, one of the biggest viruses that we know of. These are called Mimi viruses. You can see these in an infected cell by light microscopy. They are so big. Now, most viruses you need to use an electron microscope to visualize because they're so small. But Mimi viruses are about 750, 800 microns in nanometers in diameter. And you can see that these are the Mimi virus particles right here. This happens to be an electron micrograph. But uh, you can see by the size of these particles that they would be visible in light microscopy. These Mimi viruses are very interesting. They were only discovered about four or five years ago. They were discovered in a cooling tower in France. 
and the, uh, it's believed that they infect amoeba in nature, but, but we're not quite sure about that. They've since been discovered in other environments as well. And they're quite large. You can see here, uh, 400 nanometer capsid, and these fibers make it about 750 nanometers. Uh, yes, question? Uh, what are the consequences of size? Whoa, what are the consequences of size for viruses? Very interesting. So if you're very small, you can't have many genes, and you have to depend more on the cell. If you're large, like these Mimi viruses, you can have a lot of genes. The genome of Mimi's is 1.2 million base pairs. That's the biggest that we know of for viruses. And this encodes a lot of genes that aren't in any other virus. Uh, these, kind, these big DNA viruses encode their own DNA replication machinery. They even have uh, genes that uh, encode parts of the protein synthetic apparatus, which is unprecedented. So as you get bigger, you have more luxuries in what you can do on your own, independent of the cell. You become less of a parasite, although no virus can do everything on its own. So these Mimi viruses are quite interesting. They're the biggest that we know of, and they may be an ancient relative of all viruses. Maybe they were one of the first viruses to emerge. Now viruses, another part of the definition of viruses is they replicate by assembly of preformed components. They do not undergo binary fission. So bacteria, you start with one bacteria, it divides, they divide again and again, that's binary fission. Viruses don't do that. All right? And this was a puzzle for scientists for many years. They thought viruses would be like bacteria. But in fact, viruses, when you infect the cell, there's a latent or eclipse period during which you don't see any virus particles because the parts are being made. And then only when those parts are assembled into an infectious virion do you see a burst of infectivity. So it was fundamentally different from bacteria, and that's one of our fundamental dis definitions of virus particles. How old are they? Well, by sequencing genomes, we can estimate rates of molecular evolution. We can make phylogenetic trees of viruses. We can put them among the dinosaurs. And in fact, one of the first to be placed there was a herpes virus. So dinosaur had, dinosaurs had cold sores, probably. But they probably evolved much earlier. We now uh, can use sequence analysis. We're sequencing many, many viral genomes. Uh, and we can go further back. And we're going to have a lecture on evolution where we talk about the specific mechanisms that led uh, to the evolution of these viruses. Now, throughout written history, we can find what we think are references to viruses. For example, this, uh, this 700 BC piece of pottery uh, makes a reference to rabid Hector, rabies virus. Uh, here is an Egyptian steel from 1500 BC. This, this individual, his leg looks like he's got polio. We can't say if it is or not, of course, but this is uh, a perfect presentation of polio. In the 11th century, the Chinese were immunizing against smallpox. They didn't know that it was a virus present, but what they knew is that people who survived the disease, smallpox was present for many, many years, the ones who survived were protected. So they said, well, why don't we take one of these pustules and infect people with that, and they'll be protected. And that actually worked. It's called variolation. The problem is it kills 30% of the people who get the vaccine, so that's not a really good safety profile for a vaccine. Um, Lady Montague, who was the a wife of the British ambassador to Turkey. She heard about this in Turkey and she brought it back to the UK and it spread pretty wildly. Now, finally in the 1790s, Edward Jenner took a logical approach. And as we'll hear later in, in uh, the lecture on vaccines, he noticed that milkmaids who got cowpox, a mild form of smallpox on their hands, never got smallpox. So he decided to immunize people with cowpox and they were protected. That was the first vaccination. And many years later, um, Pasteur called it vaccination in Jenner's honor because of uh, the cowpox story. Now, the, the real advent of virology as a field depended on the contributions of these three individuals. Uh, the first, uh, Anton Leeuwenhoek, who made the first microscopes and made people realize there were smaller things than what you could see. Not everything was a human or an animal or a plant or, or a crab or something. You could see microscopic things. 
And for many years, people thought these arose by spontaneous generation. And Louis Pasteur put that to rest. He said these microbes, these little things swimming around, arise by reproduction. They don't arise spontaneously. And finally, Robert Koch uh, developed the germ theory of disease. He said these bacteria that Louis discovered and that Louis said multiply on their own, they cause disease. And he established a set of rules, Koch's postulates, to prove that a particular microbe causes disease. But none of these individuals knew about viruses. Viruses didn't come on the scene till after Robert Koch, uh, at the end of his life, at the end of Pasteur's life, in fact. And the reason we discovered viruses was because of cigarettes, okay? Tobacco, this is a tobacco leaf, and at the turn of the century, the end of the 1800s, tobacco was getting to be a big deal. And uh, there were lots of tobacco farms. And the farmers noticed this disease called tobacco mosaic disease, which made the leaves unsuitable to be sold for, for smoking. And a couple of scientists tried to figure out what was causing this disease. And they thought of Coke and his postulates. And they were trying to find a bacterium that caused it. And the way you would do that would be to make extracts of the leaves and then put them through a porcelain filter. And the, the porcelain filter was made in such a way that it had very small holes uh, that bacteria could not go through. And uh, so they would take these leaves and grind them up, make extracts and put them through these filters and they never could filter anything that would grow. But they noticed that if they took the filtrate and applied it to leaves, then the leaves would develop the same symptoms of tobacco mosaic disease. So something very small was going through the pores in the filter. They also knew, they learned, that if you took this broth, it would not grow. You would not get more of the agent, whatever it was. Only if you added it to a plant leaf could you get more of the agent. So a, a Russian and a, uh, a, a Dutchman uh, made this discovery with tobacco mosaic disease at the end of the 1800s. Uh, Bayerink called it contagium vivum fluidum, or virus. Virus is actually Latin, meaning slimy, liquid, or poison. And that's what they thought it was. So they didn't have a concept of a particle. They just had the concept of something passing through the filter, something very small uh, that would not grow unless cells were present. Uh, the first animal virus was foot and mouth disease virus in 1898. Again, the demonstration that the agent of this disease is filterable. And this is, uh, this is what foot and mouth disease virus does to cattle. It causes lesions in their mouth and on their feet, right? Makes perfect sense. And they found that these lesions contained a filterable agents that would cause the disease. So the key concepts here, small agents, they would go through a filter of 0.2 microns in size. And they would replicate only in a host, not in a broth like all of Pasteur's and Koch's bacteria. So that is what distinguished these agents from everything else that had been known. They were very small, and they could only replicate within a host. Now, once those discoveries were made, the field exploded. We then had many other viruses <coughs> discovered. The first human virus in 1901, yellow fever. Um, interestingly, influenza virus, not until 1933. Very interesting, because in 1918, there was a big outbreak of influenza, Spanish influenza, and it was not known that the agent was a virus at that time, only much later. And many, many more viruses uh, have since been discovered. In the 30s and 40s, the electron microscope was discovered. And for the first time, it could be shown that these agents were particulate. Remember, they were called uh, slimy liquid poison because it wasn't clear that they were particles. They didn't know. But now that an electron microscope was, was uh, invented, we could do that. Bacteriophages, here's tobacco mosaic virus. It turned out to be a rod-shaped particle, uh, rabies virus, and a virus that causes gastroenteritis, rotavirus. Today we know incredible amount about viruses. We can solve their structures at atomic resolution. So here on the left is the structure of poliovirus at 1.7 angstroms resolution. That means we can see where every atom is in three dimensions. And we can make images like this by taking the coordinates, the x, y, z coordinates of each atom, and having a, a computer uh, display them. This is 1.7 angstroms. This is about 10 angstroms resolution. You can see you don't see individual uh, 
polypeptide chains as you do here. You, you see the overall shape of the particle. And because we know the sequence of the genome of many viruses, we can calculate their chemical structures. Here's the chemical formula for poliovirus, probably the most chem complex uh, chemical you've set your eyes on so far. So we know an awful lot about virus, and, and there are lots of them. And to try and organize what we know, we classify viruses. And this is going to come up a lot in this course. You will see all sorts of names. And to make sense of them, let me explain how classification is done. So there are all sorts of virus particles of all different shapes. But we classify them in very specific ways, depending on the, the nucleic acid in the virion. This is primary. The symmetry of the protein shell, I think you can see by looking at these that some of these shells are very different. And there are very common themes that allow us to classify symmetry into really one of three different uh, shapes. Uh, the presence or absence of a lipid membrane. So some viruses are naked, as we say, like this one. And others have a lipid envelope around them. And that's a distinguishing characteristic. And finally, the, dimension, the dimensions of the virus particle or, or the capsid itself. Now, um, when you classify living things, as you know, you have this hierarchical system, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, viruses don't use all of it. Uh, we typically start with the family. You will see, for example, filoviridae. The families all end in viridae. And this is the filovirus family, and it contains the genus Ebola virus. And within the genus are many species. And for example, one of them is Zaire Ebola virus. And you will see this over and over, viridae, virus, and species. And that's how viruses are classified. Sometimes we put multiple families together to form an order, but um, it's not going to factor much into this course. Now, there is an organization called the International Congress on the Taxonomy of Viruses. These are people who meet yearly and decide how viruses should be classified. And so far, they have a website. You can sort through all of these. They have so far uh, classified 40,000 different viruses from all sorts of living things into six orders, families, genera, and species. But this is the drop in the bucket because, remember, there are 10 to the 30 bacteriophages in the ocean. And the ICTV uh, has only made a dent in that. So there are a lot more viruses that remain to be classified. And as we sequence with ease, we can do very fast and very massive genome sequencing now. We discover more and more viruses. And that makes it even harder to classify all of them. Uh, I want to give you two examples of uh, this sort of discovery, which are really interesting. So the availability of high throughput massive sequencing allows you to go into the environment and take a sample and discover all the viruses that are in it. So this is one study where um, these individuals went to a lake in Antarctica. And they drilled through the ice and they took water samples. And then they brought these back to the lab and just purified whatever was particulate and sequenced the, the DNA within them. And this particular lake, they found in just a few samples, 10,000 new virus species, 10,000 species, excuse me, from 12 different families, some of them totally new and not seen before. And this has been done in many environments. It's been done in the oceans. It's been done in mud flats all over the place. And when you do that, you always discover mostly new viruses that you have never seen before. And often, you discover new viral genes that you have never seen. So those get put into the database, and now they can be used to search new sequences against. This is a favorite one of mine. This is a, uh, so these are called metagenomic analyses, that is, sequencing the genomes of total environmental samples. This is one where they looked at raw sewage. So they went to three different locations in the US, uh, Portugal, and Africa. And they went to a sewage treatment plant and got, got 10 liters of raw sewage from each place. And they did a little bit of purification. Uh, and uh, they did sequencing and then sorted out all the sequences. They looked at these samples in the electron microscope. And you can see a variety of different virus particles there. Most of these are bacteriophages. Uh, there are viruses that infect bacteria in these sequences, fungi, people, uh, and uh, others. So this is a pie chart which shows you all of the sequences 
uh, that they obtained and where they map to. So most of them you can see are unassigned. These are brand new sequences, but they're viral because the way that they were isolated uh, makes sure that these are viral sequences. So whenever we go into new environments and do this metagenomic analysis, we discover new viruses. And who knows uh, what they're doing? Who knows whether they would be beneficial or useful to us at all? This is one of the really exciting uh, parts of virology. But I don't want you to get overwhelmed by numbers. So I've been telling you that there are lots of viruses, lots of genomes, lots of particles. The purpose of this course is to give you a unifying view of virology. All right. So uh, this, is, this is going to be a key way to simplify all of that. And that is because these viruses are, are molecular parasites, there are two things that they have to do. First of all, they have to get in a cell and that, that way they can make more viruses. And they must all make mRNA. Because no virus encodes any part or any total translation apparatus, all viruses are parasites of the translation system of the host, the ribosomes, the tRNAs, the amino acids, and so forth. All viruses need to use translation apparatus of the host. So they're parasites of that machinery. So this gives us a way to narrow down all the different viruses that we study. So we can look at the pathway to mRNA. And that enables us to simplify uh, the billions and billions of viruses that are present on the planet. 